think there's a difference between a female voice and a male voice in literature? Yeah. Even on the phone, there's a difference between a female voice and a male voice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very important that writers write in a real voice, in their own voice, but only if they're really good writers. And I have noticed, and surely even someone of your 10 years have noticed, that too many people are writing books, period. Okay, there are too many books, the books are terrible, and this is because you have been taught to have self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, you have so much self-esteem that you think, you know what, I shouldn't keep these thoughts to myself. <laughs> I should share them with the world. <laughs> when I was young in the you know, late 70s, early 80s, my first real audience was from Interview Magazine. And at that time, that audience was 99.9 .9, you know, homosexual, male homosexual. And that audience was uh, very important to me. This was part of what formed my voice. Everyone talks about the uh, effect that AIDS had on the culture in the sense, I mean, people don't talk about it anymore, but when people did talk about it, uh, they talked about, like, what artists were lost, but they never talked about this audience that was lost. Uh, you know, when people talk about, like, why, you know, the, why was New York City Ballet so great? Well, I mean, it was because of Balanchine and Jerry Robbins and people like that, but also that audience was so... I, I can't even think of the word. I mean, it, Suzanne Farrell went like this instead of this. That was it. She, could, she might as well just kill herself. There would be, like, a billion people who know exactly every single thing. You know, there was a, such a high level of connoisseurship of everything that, 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 that people like this were interested in, you know, of everything that made the culture better. You, can, you know, a very discerning audience, a very, you know, uh, an audience with a high level of connoisseurship um, is as important to the culture as artists. It's exactly as important. Now we don't have any kind of discerning audience. When that audience died, and that audience died in five minutes. Literally, uh, people didn't die faster in a war. And it allowed, of course, like the third, the second, third, fourth tier to rise to the front. Because, of course, the first people who died of AIDS were the people who, I don't know how to put this, got laid a lot. Okay, now imagine who didn't get AIDS. Okay, that's who was then lauded as like the great, you know, artist, okay? You know, if the other people that hadn't died had been alive, if they all came back to life, and I would say to them, Guess who's a big star? <laughs> guess, you never, guess who has a Sean brother? Guess who's like a famous photographer? Get, you, they, wait, they would like fall on the floor. Are you kidding me? Because everyone else died. Last man standing, okay? I mean, that had, a t that loss of that audience had a terrible effect, and a terrible effect on me. Uh, I mean, by, by which, not just a sad personal effect on me, but a terrible effect on me because Everything has to be broader. I mean, I don't do that, you know, but everyone else did, you know. Everything has to be more blatant, more on the nose, broader, you know, because obviously they're not going to pick up little subtleties. Things in the culture that had nothing to do with the New York City Ballet, you know, it just got dumbed down, dumbed down, dumbed down, all the way down. It's one of the reasons we wanted to come here was to show the country the Oscar Levant show. And, and you Pretty must degrading, have, isn't it? No, it is not. <laughs> it's probably the most brilliant wit on, on ever you on television. You know, you must television. understand about wit. Wit's very infrequent. You mentioned so-called wits, and they've said two or three things in their whole lifetime. Almost. It's I true. Know, I know. Now, humorous is something else. Yeah. You know, that crackle-barreled, aw shucks, Charlie Weaver stuff who gets off color every now and then. Uh, that's, he's really very good. I, I don't dig my toe in. I'm not a crackle barrel philosopher. Well, a humorist is just a comedian that scratches. Isn't that more or less what happens? No, a humorist is somebody like you who has four writers and then ad libs for the rest of the. No, that's. <laughs> it's hard being his friend, I'll tell you that. <laughs> See, what we have had in the last, like, 30 years is too much democracy in the culture, not enough democracy in the society. There's no reason to have democracy in the culture. None. Because the culture should be made by a natural aristocracy of talent. Okay? I mean, by which I mean, like, no, it, here's, it doesn't have to do with, you know, what race you are, or what country you're from, or what religion you are. It should have to do with how good are you mm -hmm. at this thing. And that is a natural aristocracy. No, your book is not as good as anyone else's book. You know, no, you know, your life story would not make a book, good book. Don't even try. You know, I, I had to introduce Toni Morrison as somebody to give her an award because she has not received enough. 
And, you know, since everyone was, like, gathered here to see Tony get her 8 millionth award, I said, um, since you're, now that I have you all here, I just want to say one thing. When Toni Morrison said, write the book you want to read, she did not mean everyone. <laughs> okay?